We're going to approach this topic tonight kind of like we approach a lot of these cases, and that's in a, a little bit of a team approach. So I'm going to kind of start out first and just go over a little bit of an introduction, talk about just osteosarcoma in general. Um, Dr. Calfield will come in and then speak about some of the local therapy options that we have, and then I'll follow up in the second half tonight talking about secondary disease and metastasis. So. Most of you, I'll, I'll introduce myself again. Most of you, I think, I think a lot of us have met. For those who haven't met, um, my name is Jared Vansell, and I am the, the new medical oncologist here at National Veterinary Specialist. Started in August, and been a, been a really good experience so far. And I just want to thank everybody for all their hospitality and warm welcome to Nashville. I'm loving the city, and, and certainly love the hospital I'm working for. So, we're going to go ahead and get started, and and. Uh, Osteosarcoma is a, is a pretty common disease that we see. Uh, it, it's defined, I, I usually start these, present, or these presentations with a definition. So it's defined as just a malignant tumor of bone. And in humans, you can hear it referred to as osteogenic sarcoma or primary tumor of bone. It is, uh, I, I said it was common, but it makes up about 3 to 4%, I guess, of all the canine tumors that we see on a yearly basis. Um, but it is the most common skeletal neoplasia that we see and certainly the most common primary bone tumor that we see in dogs. It affects the appendicular skeleton about 75% of the time. When we see osteosarcoma affecting the axial skeleton, again, it's a, it's a much lower percentage, only about 25%. It is, uh, it, it's, a, it's a tough disease. It kind of has a double whammy. Um, it's a locally invasive disease, can cause a lot of destruction to the bone that it's affecting, as well as has, has an elevated metastatic potential. Uh, the metastatic rate on osteosarcoma is somewhere around 90% if left untreated or if only surgery is done alone. So in a year's time, if you only do an amputation or you only do surgery or you don't treat these guys, certainly 90% of them will go on to develop a pretty significant secondary metastatic disease. Metastasis can see, be seen in, in various locations. The pulmonary parenchyma is certainly the most common location we see affected. But other things that you might not think of, like regional lymph nodes or even distant lymph nodes can be involved. Um, other parts of the skeleton can be involved, other bones, as well as soft tissue. So definitely have seen several of these metastasized to some unusual locations like muscle, skin, subcutaneous tissue. The age of onset is interesting. It is a little bit unique in osteosarcoma that it has a bimodal age prevalence. Definitely see it in that middle aged to older um, aged dog that we can see a lot of, of neoplasia in, 7 to 10 years of age. But with osteosarc, there's also a juvenile form of the disease that occurs around 18 to 24 months. In humans, osteosarcoma is, is predominantly a juvenile disease. A lot of kids are afflicted with this disease, um, and it's a lot less common to see in older people. Uh, and certainly in dogs, we see this peak as well, again, at that one and a half to two years of age. Reports as young as six months have been, uh, have been reported in cases of osteosarcoma. So the reason I bring that up is certainly it's just something to remember. Even if you see a young dog that presents with a swelling or a lameness, osteosarcoma still has to be on your, on your list of differentials. The sex predilection on, on osteosarcoma, in my opinion, is pretty evenly distributed. Male and females are, are distributed uh, pretty equally. Uh, there was a, a, a recent paper that said that there was a slight overrepresentation in male dogs, but there's a much, much longer, uh, larger, what we refer to as a meta-analysis, where some folks at Colorado State took all of, uh, a lot of papers, I guess, of osteosarcoma, went through them, calculated what the signalment was, and in that one, and there was over 2,000 dogs in that study, uh, they showed a, a pretty equal distribution. Intact male and female patients have been reported to be a little bit of an increased risk, but, uh, but again, not anything significant, not anything that would change what your recommendations in terms of spaying and neutered would be. What is significance is the breed and size. We, we see this in our larger breed, giant breed dogs. Um, large dogs are going to be more affected than smaller dogs. In fact, we only see about 5% of dogs weighing less than 15 kilograms that are afflicted with appendicular osteosarcoma. The side of predilection, um, this is, hey, we're going to show you several images throughout tonight. I'll show you some in just a few moments. Dr. Calfee will show you several so you'll get a good idea of where this metaphyseal region is. But osteosarcoma is, is predominantly affecting just that, the, the, the metaphyseal region, um, not the epiphysis, that most distal aspect of the bone, and, and not the di diaphysis, the center of the bone. 
The front limbs are affected twice as often as the rear limbs. And in those front limbs, the two most common locations is going to be the radius, uh, distal radius that is, and proximal humerus. And so since the front limbs are more affected, those are your two most likely locations to ever see an osteosarcoma in, uh, in dogs. It also can affect the rear limbs. Again, it's a little less common, but we do see a lot of those. Uh, the most common location in these cases is going to be your distal femur, your proximal tibia, and then also the distal tibia. So something that I was taught and I always remember and I always talk to people about is away from the elbow and close to the knee. And that's true. I mean, it, it definitely is. Those are going to be just a quick way for you to remember where the most likely places you can find this tumor at. Um, you just have to remember there's also an increased incidence in that distal tibia, and we see some of those as well. And again, on a side note, I mean, you can see this anywhere, but these are, these are certainly going to be the most likely places that you'll see them. When you look at clinical presentation, I've seen these guys present in a whole variety of ways. They can have just an acute onset of lameness. They were out at the park, running, playing, and all of a sudden they acutely came up lame. Or they can have a chronic history where an owner starts to tell me a story about how this dog slowly over the last month has become more and more painful. Sometimes you can have a limb swelling, a mass at the, at the side of the lameness, or, or sometimes there's not any swelling at all. And some of that is related to, again, the severity of the tumor. Is it a very lytic tumor, not causing a lot of production and, and firm swelling there? Or is it a really osteoproductive uh, tumor at that distal radius and you're seeing a pretty significant swelling? But the unifying factor on a lot of these guys and something that to remember is that typically they're, they're fairly healthy, they're, they're fairly normal other than that lameness. They're eating well, they're drinking well. With osteosarcoma, usually it just comes down to them uh, being uncomfortable. So on your initial evaluation, I usually try to get as much information as I can. So I try to get a good history on just the onset, the duration. Uh, it wouldn't be likely for someone to say, you know, this has been going on for two years and, and you know, now I'm coming in to have it evaluated unless just acutely it became a lot worse. You find out about that appetite, activity, attitude. Are these guys otherwise healthy, um, just lame, or have a swelling? And then travel history. You know, you know we're going to talk in a little bit about things, other options, or other, other things that these diseases um, that should be on your differential list, that is. So travel history, trying to rule out, did these guys go to a river valley recently, been around um, a chicken coop where they could pick up some type of fungal disease, been out in the southwest part of the country? I mean, those are things that are, that are certainly rare, but, but getting a good travel history is important. Uh, and then a good complete physical exam for a couple reasons. One, you want to see is there other spots of the body that are concerning, that are overly painful, that might be involved. And, and second, is this patient just orthopedically and neurologically sound? So when we start to think about treatment options, those are going to be important things that you need to know. When we look at diagnostic tests, getting a good minimum database is important with CBC, chemistry, urinalysis, and I'm, I'm going to talk about what you're looking for in just a minute on those tests. And then limb radiographs. This is going to be your primary diagnostic step when you, when you see one of these guys present to you. Getting multiple views are really helpful. I've definitely seen some of these tumors that even on two views are very hard to diagnose and they're very subtle and you have to take some, um, some little angle views. But typically I do recommend just starting with getting a good lateral, good cranial caudal view of that area that you're investigating, um, it, it's, it's, again, it's going to be your primary diagnostic tool when you're evaluating these guys. Thoracic radiographs are, are certainly the next step. Uh, y anytime you're considering neoplasia, anytime you're considering even something like fungal disease, getting a, a three-view set of chest x-rays is going to tell you a lot. And the last is, is nuclear scintigraphy, which is a, is a very useful diagnostic tool and something that I'm going to talk a little bit more later. Right now I'm just going to kind of leave it alone and we'll come back to that and, and go into a lot of detail about it in just a few minutes. So on the, on the minimum database, what are you looking for? Well, the CBC, things like that, you're just really looking for overall general health. Is there any marked anemia? Is there any evidence of a marked infection or inflammatory response that might support something like osteomyelitis? Uh, you're looking for that just overall systemic disease process that could be going on. On the chemistry panel, again, systemic disease, other underlying complicating factors, and renal function. Renal function is real important because when we start to talk about systemic therapy options, chemotherapy options, we may be discussing some nephrotoxic drugs, so it's important to know do these guys have any underlying renal disease? 
The most important thing you're probably going to pick up in an osteosarc patient on chemistry is alkaline phosphatase. So ALP or alkaline phosphatase is a, is a, um, a bone isoenzyme that can be released in, in heavy episodes of osteogenic turnover, production, or lysis. So when you look at that elevation, it's telling you a little bit of about the story about what's happening with this tumor. Is there a significant amount of destruction? Has this tumor been there a while? Released a lot of isoenzyme into the circulation. You're seeing this elevation. The reason that it's important because it can be a very, very big prognostic indicator. Recent or, or early reports reported sometimes a marked elevation in ALP could lower your survival time by up to 50%. So that's really important to know. I always talk to owners about that when I see elevation, telling them that this is somewhat of a negative prognostic indicator. Now, it's not, however, a reason not to treat one of these patients. There have certainly been some cases that I've seen that go on and do very, very well, even with marked elevations in alkaline phosphatase. And there was a study that came out of Colorado with 50 dogs that showed that in these guys there wasn't a big difference in those cases in terms of having an elevated ALP and not having an elevated ALP. But in my mind, it is not something you like to see, and it's something I always talk to owners about. And then finally on your analysis, you're, you're looking for any kind of underlying complicating factor and renal function. Radiographs, they're going to be our big thing, though. And, and, and these lesions that we see on radiographs can certainly vary. And I'm going to show you some examples in a few minutes. But they can be extremely lytic and hardly any osteoproduction at all. Just a very large, lytic, punched-out lesion in the bone. Or they can have a significant amount of bony production with a lot of osteoproduction going on in the area of the tumor. Really, the reason that can happen, it, it, it comes down to what cancer is. And cancer is just an overproduction of some particular cell in your body, whether it's a bone cell or a muscle cell or a blood cell. In the case of bone tumors, you can have an overproduction of simply osteoclasts. You can have a tumor that develops in that line of cells that starts producing a ton of osteoclasts, causing a lot of lysis to the bone, and leaving you with a very lytic, lytic tumor. Or you can have a significant overproduction or replication of osteoblasts leading to a very productive tumor, lots of bone production, lots of bulky calcification. Or you can certainly just have a combination of both. Sometimes when you're having a lot of osteoproduction, the body's trying to go in and correct it, and it has some remodeling aspects to it, leaving you with this, this very moth-eaten type of production where it's a combination of both. But you have to keep that in mind when you look at the tumors. They can certainly vary. There's some key things you're looking for on these tumors. The first one for me is whenever I'm talking to someone and I'm considering osteosarc is, is where's is it at? Is it in one of those primary locations that we just spoke about? Um, those, are, those are real important. Again, it can be seen in, in other, other areas, but if someone says, I have a really, really lytic tumor or a really lytic bone lesion in the distal radius uh, in the metaphyseal region, I'm going to start to certainly think that this is most likely a bone tumor right then. Uh, also, the lesions should not cross the articular cartilage. So that's real important. When you have arthritis in a joint, certainly multiple bones can be affected. You can have a lot of uh, distant osteophytes affecting the, the areas of that bone. These osteosarcomas really should be localized to one particular bone, affecting that metaphyseal region, not jumping over involving other bones, but just that solitary bone. You should have some cortical lysis, or certainly that is something that we see with a lot of these tumors, or have just a lot of bony production with a palisading reaction or even that classic sunburst appearance where you're seeing a lot of obliteration of the bone in general. One key finding that you look for sometimes is lifting of the periosteum from this new bone production, and it gives you somewhat of a triangle appearance, and I'll point one of those out to you in a minute, and it's referred to by, uh, as Codman's triangle, and that is something that's very characteristic and we see with a lot of osteosarcs. So here are a few images, and... As you see on the first one here, and these all three are osteosarc, but they all three look very different. This one's just very, very lytic uh, in this distal femur. Um, obviously not a lot of production going on, just a lot of, a lot of lysis. This one here has a ton of osteoproduction. Um, it is, it, it's predominantly productive with a lot of bony production in that area. And this one here is, is a combination of both. Now, as you see right here, you, you've got some discontinuation of the cortex. You've got some lifting of the periosteum right here, making that Codman's triangle. Again, this is more of a classic, uh, a more classic osteosarcoma. 
So when you see these findings and it's in one of these primary locations, certainly your top differential should be osteosarcoma. The consistent clinical findings, the patient's otherwise healthy, just coming up with this lameness and there's this radiographic apparent lesion. Your number one thing that you should talk to owners about is, is until proven otherwise, certainly is that this is most likely a bone tumor. Are there other causes that can cause, or other, are there other diseases that can cause some of these uh, same radiographic changes? Well, there are. The most likely next thing would be, again, other types of cancer. A lot of people jump right to osteomyelitis, or maybe it's a bone cyst or even fungal, but honestly the next thing on my list is going to be just more types of cancer because that is what we see. We certainly see other tumors that can affect the bone, Con uh, chondrosarcoma, fibrosarcoma, hemangiosarcoma. They're less likely, but they certainly can affect the bone. Things like metastatic neoplasia, like metastatic carcinoma, certainly can affect bones. Uh, usually those are going to be located more around uh, the nutrient foramen, which is in the diaphysis. These are hematogenously spreading to the bone. They're going to come through that nutrient foramen, get lodged in the bone in that location, and cause some lysis or, or, or lesion in that area. So again, location can, can lead you a little bit when you see that. But other types of cancer would be the next thing on my list. Systemic mycosis, bacterial osteomyelitis, those are definitely possibilities. A lot of that use what you're seeing clinically. Are these guys running a fever? Are they sick? Do they have um, a history that fits with that? Again, lower on the list, but possible. And then finally, bone cysts, which is incredibly rare in dogs. We don't see a lot of it. It's certainly a possibility, but it is, it is very rare. So when you have those radiographic changes like I showed, there's a few diseases, even if it's not osteosarcoma, that don't require some type of surgical intervention. Most of them do require a removal of that affected bone to, to efficiently treat the disease. If the presentation fits and the diagnostics support it, it is okay to discuss with a client to the consideration of doing histologic confirmation at the time of removal. And Dr. Calfee is going to show you some images here in a few minutes. And there are certainly some tumors when you look at it and go, there's no reason really to save that bone. That bone is destroyed. It's going to need to come out. Uh, and so we would go straight to it. But there are certainly cases where we look at it and we think, you know, I'm just not 100%. So before we go in and remove this bone or remove that leg, we really need to get a diagnosis. Or you may have times where the owner just says, I have to know Alec, before I take that leg off, it's for sure osteosarcoma. So the next thing that we're going to be talking about is gaining that pre-surgical diagnosis. And so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Calfee and let him chat with you guys for a while. All right, perfect. <clears throat> um, I want to say thanks again for y'all coming. Like it's, I know you guys are busy. you got a lot of stuff going on. I think Jared just stole my water. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, oh, <laughs> Um, but we really, we really do appreciate that. And this is, a, uh, this is a great opportunity for me kind of personally whenever we started this practice. The goal was to have oncology here to match up with my surgical oncology background. And so Jared like really helps out with that. And you'll see uh, <clears throat> a few things with this talk. One is he's smarter than I am. Um, and he, uh, he just knows a lot about medical oncology and it's a good addition for us to be able to deliver a more comprehensive. Thank you. Um, uh, cancer care, which is the goal, basically. <clears throat> so my, my, my talk is pretty confined. Um, I just really have a couple of goals that I'm, that I'm trying to go through. One is the decision on whether or not tissue sampling is needed and some logistics about how that occurs. I'm going to talk about cytology versus biopsy and the need to biopsy. Um, <clears throat> and then two, just to talk about surgery and to deliver some helpful hints uh, for procedures that you guys do because I assume most everybody out there is amputating the leg at some point. And so I'll just talk about when I amputate a leg, how do I do it? Um, uh, what are the things that I think technically uh, have been helpful for me? <clears throat> um, things to look out for. And then I'm going to talk a bit about uh, limb sparing options and so more advanced things that, that uh, aren't going to be offered at a whole lot of places and uh, talk about our decisions about how we decide to do that. So <clears throat> to begin with, um, uh, you know, this, this is the big question here. At Colorado where I trained, I was actually quite surprised that there was not as much biopsy going on there, on there as I thought there would have been. They were in a little bit of a different situation from a fungal standpoint. They didn't have much of any fungal stuff going on out there. and so. They uh, were very aggressive about doing definitive therapies without biopsying with some regularity. Um, and I mean, the reason was is because 
you looked at 100,000 osteosarcomas and you get a feel for it and, and you start having discussions with owners about costs and time and uh, morbidity, et cetera. And, and so um, and that, that was kind of their take on it. So I don't think every lesion has to be sampled. Um, uh, you'll find out through this, I'm a pretty big advocate of cytology uh, because, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll kind of show you as we go along. But um, so whenever I'm thinking about whether or not I'm going to push an owner or really advocate strongly for tissue sampling beforehand, um, the first thing I'm thinking about is that there's a lot of variability associated with these tumors. And so, I mean, some dogs come in looking like this. And I mean, the one thing we know about this is this dog's leg is going away. Like, you can't fix this. <clears throat> uh, it doesn't have any distal radius left. This lesion extended uh, well up into the mid diaphysis. It's got a distal ulnar fracture as well. And this is not repairable in, in, in any way. Um, and so in this particular situation, then I'm, I'm talking about uh, the decision to sample this really based on, um, <clears throat> one, sometimes an owner just needs to know. And uh, you, know, you certainly could have a scenario where this could be something other than an osteosarcoma. It could be a fungal disease. And there could be some logistical implications there. And so the decision at that point usually goes down to you know, some owners will say, all right, I'll amputate a leg if I can get a week of life out of my dog. And some owners will say, I will not do that unless I'm highly convinced my dog's going to get four years. And so I really feel like you have to go back to the owner um, to talk about, you know, the logistics of what they're looking for. There are three, this is the same slide with three different images, but, you know, the, the first slide was really just an example of really severe disease. This is more kind of middle of the road. I mean, we've got a very proliferative lesion on the cranial aspect of the radius, you know, very clearly defined, not a whole lot of bone destruction here. I mean, there, there's a lot more bone that's left in this dog, um, which as you'll see, it goes, as we go along, you know, opens up a little bit of a different discussion. And then there's these guys. So this is a dog that we saw just a month or so ago that the referring did a really good job on this dog because it was like a six-year-old golden retriever had, um, <clears throat> had a history that was just classic for a cruciate. Um, we're going to see, uh, we end up biopsying this, and I'm going to show you some images of this dog. But, um, you know, it just didn't have a fusion, didn't have arthritis radiographically. It didn't have changes that were consistent with cruciate disease. And on the standard lateral and AP of this dog, it's a very subtle change in this distal in the sisal femur, but here you can see. I mean, there's something going on here, but I mean, that's a small enough lesion that I'm going to feel very different about this dog than I did about the first dog whose radius is gone. And so, all that plays into my discussions with an owner. Um, when it comes to dealing with appendicular osteosarcoma, um, and this will come up down the road as well. I, I feel like you just really have to like. I mean, I feel like for me personally, you guys are in a bit of a different situation because for many of these clients, you've got a long-term relationship with them, but they pop in the door here and within 15 minutes, we're deciding what are we going to do. And so we've got to, we've got to be really intensive about making sure we understand what our owner's priorities, you know, what do they think about amputation? That's a word that, um, you know, again, we'll talk about a bit down the road, but most people have a real distinct idea in their mind about what amputation means. And I think most of the time they've got um, some misconceptions, you know, in that regard. Um, and so it's just, it's just real important for me to understand what are the pressure points for a client whenever we're trying to make, we're talking to them about sampling and then treatment going forward. And then sometimes you have to lead them. And so if I had a client that came in and said, I don't want, I don't care about what this is from a biopsy standpoint, I'm going to be very reluctant to go along with that. I'm going to say, I want to know what this thing is. This is a small lesion. You know, is it feasible this is a bone cyst? Is it feasible this is a focal osteomyelitis somewhere the leg could be saved? And I'm going to be very reluctant to move forward with treatment on this dog. Whereas on that first one, I'm totally comfortable taking that dog's leg off. <clears throat> okay. So as far as sampling goes, I mean, your two options are going to be cytology or biopsy. I am an advocate for cytology <clears throat> um, for multiple reasons. Uh, the big one really is time because you've got a dog that's got a significant lesion. Quite often they're in a lot of pain. If you're going to biopsy that, you've got to throw about four to seven days between you and some definitive therapy. So there's a lot of time that goes into it, whereas cytology is going to allow you the opportunity to get results back in about a 24-hour period. And so this is really a large uh, um, criteria for me as far as making decisions about how I would sample. 
you know, expense certainly, <clears throat> uh, we'll talk about this a bit more, but with cytology, you're generally not talking about anesthesia. It's just easier, it's cheaper, uh, it's less invasive. From a reliability standpoint, I mean, there are several papers that have looked at bone cytology in dogs, and they've shown somewhere between 65 and, and 87 percent kind of specificity sensitivity numbers. Um, I really feel like that this number is much closer to, to the high, high 80s because I think it's highly user dependent. I mean, you have, to, you have to be real deliberate about getting a sample that you feel is going to be diagnostic for you. And you have to screen those samples to make sure you don't, you're just not sending them a lot of blood. And so I think you can affect this number uh, quite heavily. Um, now, having said that, there are going to be some situations where I'm not going to do a bone cytology. I'm going to, I'm going to push for a biopsy. And we'll talk about that going forward. But in general, if I feel like I can, if I can do cytology on a bone lesion, I'd much prefer to do that. It's cheaper, it's quicker, and it generally can get you an answer. The, the one downside of doing cytology over biopsy is that you have the ability with biopsy, in theory, to do grading on these tumors. And there, uh, there's at least one study that's looked at tumor grading for osteosarcomas and shown that you can prognosticate off of that. And it's not real common for people to use that information. Um, but there certainly is an argument there. And so if you had a client that's like, I really want to know, like, is my dog likely going to fall on the long end of survival or likely going to fall in the short term? Then we look at things like, you know, prognostic indicators like ALP, what Dr. Vance was talking about, tumor size, um, <clears throat> and then potentially tumor grading. So. All right, so from an instrumentation standpoint, if you need to biopsy, there's not a lot of equipment that's, that's necessary by any stretch of the imagination. These are the two biopsy uh, pieces that we have here. So this is a jam sheety bone biopsy. This comes in a couple of different gauges. You know, this is it's just, it's like taking a soil sample basically from your yard. And so you've got a, a core um, <coughs> biopsy shaft here and then this uh, just pushes the sample out basically. And then this is a Michelle tree find. And these will come in a lot of variable millimeter sizes so you can go down to maybe six millimeters all the way up to 14 or so. Uh, I think ours is maybe an eight millimeter biopsy. Um, but the concept of the, both these guys, um, you know, is very similar. As far as logistically, how do you do a biopsy and what are the, um, you know, technical aspects that you want to pay attention to? Pretty much every dog that gets a bone biopsy with me is going to be under general anesthesia. I certainly don't want to do any wrestling with these guys. I, I don't think that that's appropriate. And, you know, I'm a big draper. Uh, <clears throat> I want to be able to create some sort of, create a sterile surgical field that I can work on. So I, I advocate for clip and prep and giving yourself enough space where you can have a sterile field and then some place to lay these instruments. As far as general recommendations for technique, <clears throat> um, you know, another downside of biopsy is that you have the potential to increase the possibility of a pathologic fracture. You know, you're taking a bigger sample, you're removing bone, and so as opposed to cytology, you could predispose to a fracture a bit more. Um, and you can avoid doing that by avoiding bicortical samples. And so there's, here's a lesion very well demarcated here, a lot of normal bone around it. We wouldn't want to be too aggressive going in here and taking a lot of this bone out. And so here you're probably going in cranial lateral and you're going to go through that cranial lateral cortex. And then you can generally feel when you hit the, the trans cortex and you're not going to want to push through that. You don't want to create that, that focal weak spot. You're generally going to sample right in the center of the lesions. That's different than soft tissue tumors. Typically the recommendation there is to take a sample from the periphery of the tumor and the normal tissue so the pathologist can look at that, that line of demarcation. With bone, you get a lot of reactive changes on the periphery, so that can confuse your sample. So you want to go pretty much right in the center. Um, you want to pay attention to, like, in theory, what would the surgery be beyond this? And this really just gets into limb spare surgeries. If your biopsy and, and limb spares here, for the most part, are going to be distal radius, radial and ulnar fractures. Um, uh, samples, you're going to try to go kind of right over the cranial part of the radius, and so that in biopsy tract incision could be taken out. Um, <clears throat> and then you want a radiograph to confirm. You don't want to, like, anesthetize the dog, take the sample, you know, submit it. You get back a non-diagnostic sample, and you don't even you haven't even confirmed that on your radiographs you actually took the piece of bone from the correct location. So you want to radiograph these, radiograph these so you can objectively say yes we were in the place that we wanted to be. Okay, 
so this is that dog I was talking about. <clears throat> so I think she's approximately six year old golden retriever, several week history of acute onset right rear limb lameness. And came in with radiographs, which had already um, you know, mentioned this uh, bone abnormality on the distal femur here. But I mean, the thing that, this is where you just gotta pay attention because I mean, like we see so many dogs coming in with cruciate ligament disease that it is easy to just be like cruciate, 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 cruciate. And this is that dog that's not a cruciate. I mean, it should have been a cruciate. But the thing is, this dog does not have any substantial effusion. There's really no osteoarthritis. And if you look very closely, there's some bone loss that's present here. Um, on the AP view, <clears throat> you can see on the medial side of the femoral condyle, um, or the medial, medial femoral condyle, um, there's some bone production on the, around the periosteum. And then it's hard to see on this image, but there was also some bone loss that went in here. We had to do, we had to basically do some oblique views to isolate out the medial femoral condyle and you know, then the lesion so it shows up uh, more, more clearly at that point. So this dog is in radiology at this point, and so <clears throat> you know, it, it takes a little bit of kind of logistical finagling to make sure you're going to get an appropriate sample, but we just use needles. So we, we go and put this dog you know, for a standard lateral uh, radiograph with a dog in uh, right lateral recumbency of the medial side up here. Just take a hypodermic needle, stick that in, take an x-ray, see where the needle is. Do the same, take another needle, take an x-ray, see where that needle is. And then we just use the point of that, you know, leave those needles in, and then, then I know at that point I need to be just a little bit caudal to come in here to do the biopsy. So here's a jam shooty bone biopsy instrument here, and we're going straight into the lesion, um, taking a sample, and then, you know, you need, need to objectively look at what you pull out. I mean, this should be a little core of bone. You know, it shouldn't be complete mush. <clears throat> Um, so you want to evaluate the apparent quality of that. And then you can't really see on this image, uh, but there is a core that's taken out right here. So we confirm that we got what we were looking for. Um, you could do intraop or you could do like on-site uh, impression smear cytology if you wanted to get um, a better idea of whether or not you had abnormal cells. We, di we didn't in this dog just because we felt comfortable with that. This actually came back. We don't have the final histopath. We amputated this dog's leg like two weeks ago, and I just checked on it today, but this is a chondroblastic version of an osteosarcoma, which is, it was very rare to see that, um, but it would make sense based on the location, on the distal femoral condyle. Okay, <clears throat> so fine needle aspiration. Um, so this is a very doable technique, basically. There's no fancy equipment. Um, uh, this is very doable, and uh, I think it's, high, it's a highly useful tool because it's simple and, and gives good information. Um, you really need lesions that have significant cortical lysis. You're not going to aspirate bone lesions that are primarily osteoproductive. You just won't be able to go through that bone. You need to be able to get into the medullary canal. Um, <clears throat> so this would be a perfect example of that. And you'll just push straight through this. You don't have to worry about trying to avoid two cortices because that bone's gone anyway. Um, these guys are going to need some sort of sedation. Uh, we typically do a local block over the area that we're sampling. Um, the equipment is a 6 or 12 cc syringe and then a large gauge needle um, <clears throat> and microscope slides. Um, I use a, I mean it's almost like an ice cream scooping technique. So basically what you're trying to do is avoid a lot of suction on the syringe because you can easily hemodilute these guys and you just got a syringe full of blood because that's what's going to be in the medullary canal. So you want to minimize blood and go in and I basically just scrape. You can feel the, the, um, the trabecular bone that you're hitting. You're just scraping bone into the end of that syringe. Sometimes you'll end up with a core biopsy, so you'll get you know, a little tube of bone. Most of the time not, and then I'll immediately uh, ask or spray those samples onto microscope slides. And the big thing here is you've got to go look at those samples now. <clears throat> so you put them on the slide, smear them out, go to the microscope, look at them, and make sure that you've got a sample that um, looks like it's going to be diagnostic. And this is what you're looking for. You know, you're, you're looking for it not to be full of blood cells, and you're looking for large cells with a large nuclear cytoplasmic ratio. They're typically going to be basophilic. You can, I don't, I don't spend any time trying to go, yeah, this looks like malignant cells, and you could easily be confused because bone marrow cells can look like this. Well, all I'm looking for is, okay, I've got these big cells in there. But my experience is that <clears throat> by doing this, if I can give them a sample that looks like this, they're going to come back to me with an answer. And, and 
Um, usually osteosarcomas, I mean osteosarcomas are what the vast majority of them are and usually those have enough characteristics of cell cellular atypia that they're, they're not going to really waffle with you. So real useful. Um, okay, so that's my little bitty blurb on, on tissue sampling. <clears throat> so as far as control of local disease goes, um, there is a humongous spectrum of options that's available right now, um, <clears throat> but the mainstay for these dogs is going to be amputation. And I guess that's the point I would get across. Like, I really don't spend any time trying to talk an owner into limb spares unless I need to do that. Um, and you'll see as this goes on, because limb spares have some significant downsides, um, <clears throat> but there are some dogs that need them. But amputation is, go I'm going to be trying to make every dog have an amputation, but I'm looking for reasons for why, what might not. Um, so amputation, limb spare, which we'll talk about, and then other, and this is where I'm saying that there's a big spectrum. I mean, a big one is palliative radiation therapy, and Jared will talk about that a little bit later, but that's a viable option for clients. It's generally, uh, you know, the aim of that is to treat pain and preserve limb function over a short period of time that's available in Knoxville right now. So this is a very viable option for us right here now. Um, stereotactic radiation therapy and high dose intraoperative radiation, <coughs> this is the one you really want to keep a lookout for because stereotactic is, is um, it's, a, it's the use of radiation, it's your standard kind of LINAC, but it's on this real complicated kind of gantry that allows the machine to be rotated around <laughs> what you're radiating. So you basically can give um, a dog like all of its doses of radiation in one day, and the way they do that is they do these real complicated algorithms where they can center the beam just on what you're trying to shoot at, and then they keep moving it so all the external tissues get spared. And so the University of Florida does this, Colorado State does this now, and you know, it costs about a million dollars to put these machines in. Well, probably like four million dollars to put a machine in. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, standardly over time, potentially more of this would come along. And this really changes the game as far as radiation goes because now all of a sudden you don't have a month of radiation. You've got two days or one day. So, anyway. Um, all right. So, an important point for me is uh, with amputations, I feel like you have to be proactive about communication. In general, my philosophy and a philosophy that we advocate for this hospital is that we want, we want to do what people want us to do. We don't want to come in here with our own agenda telling people that they should do this or should do that with their pets. Um, and we want people to decide that. But my experiences with amputations is that that's the word chemotherapy and the word amputation are two <coughs> words that owners just, they can get locked up on. And I feel like that they just don't have information um, about the realities of it sometimes. And so I'm relatively proactive about saying, okay, I, I know that you say you don't want to do an amputation on your dog, but let me at least explain to you what an amputation would mean. Um, and with some frequency, people are like, oh, well, that sounds like that would be okay. Um, so I'm, I'm proactive about communication about that. The goal for amputation is, is for animals to be comfortable and functional. Um, and uh, that, that is certainly accomplishable in a very predictable manner. Um, and with a, with, a, with a very predictable outcome with high functions in some of these dogs, which I'm surprised about how the clients say how well they get around. Um, and again, you want to talk to people about these preconceived notions, and I don't, I try not to do it in some sort of preachy way, but I'm just of the opinion I have information that you need in order to make decisions, and so I'll be proactive about that. So what animals tolerate amputations? I think most every dog. Uh, the ones that struggle the most really are the brachycephalic or the short wide dogs because it just, they just get a leg that's kind of out here on a lever arm and they're having to support that. Where the big tall dogs, they just put it straight underneath them and they can really get around very well. So the brachycephalic dogs, those, real, those English bulldogs that are really wide, um, I feel like that they're, they're going to struggle more. The giant breed dogs often do great Pelvic limbs are generally going to do better than thoracic limbs just based on body weight distribution. 60% um, of the weight's on the front legs. Um, <clears throat> and then I do look for contraindications, and certainly there are animals that come in here that I'm like, I will not do an amputation on your dog. It's just not going to work. Dogs with severe hip dysplasia, bilateral cruciate disease, you know, degenerative myelopathy, um, you know, concurrent orthopedic current neurologic disease, advanced age animals. Um, and animals that are extremely obese. I mean, there's some of them you just know they're not, they're not going to do well. And so you do have to keep an eye out for those. It's very, very important to do a complete, thorough neurologic and orthopedic examination before you ever cut a dog's leg off. 
I have done it one time where I've amputated a dog and it didn't work, and I just wasn't thorough enough on the front end for that. For that, I mean, it, it was, the dog was not a good candidate for an amputation, and, and you know, it just was unpleasant. Okay, I've got to do a little bit of. So I've just got a couple of videos of dogs that have had amputations on the rear limb, um, just to show kind of my experience with them. Um, <clears throat> so Irish Wolfhound. Um, this is just one to two days post-op, uh, real limb amputation, and just getting around. My experience with these guys is you just have to teach them to walk. You know, certainly if they have not been using their leg, or if they've been using the leg that you remove right before you remove it, they, t they have a harder time adjusting to an amputation. Um, if they have not been using that leg, then they're going to go really quickly. Uh, it seems like a number of these dogs, they have to kind of work up some stamina. You know, I mean, like you'll you'll walk them on those first couple of days, and you have to support them with the sling pretty pretty proactively, and then it might take them three or four weeks to really get stamina up to where they're they're much more um, you know much more able to get around for an extended period of time. But they they pick it up really quickly, and I feel like that most dogs are going to have quite good endurance. Um, you know, in, in a relatively short period of time, the things that I, I do think is important to communicate with owners. A couple of things. One is to talk to them about the logistics of, um, oh, oh, talk to them the logistics about, <clears throat> you know, that they're going to be tired. And you got to help them for a little bit. So set expectations. I think is important, and I feel like you really got to talk to them about what that what that incision is going to look like. I've had a couple of clients come in, and they're like, I mean, they just do that pass out look because the incisions are big, and so you need to set people up, you know, for that. But with a little bit of front work, it can work out real well. So technical tips for rear limb amputations. Um, in general, you want to leave more lateral skin than medial skin. The effect of that is that that brings the incision up more to the medial side where it's less visible. Um, not a big deal. The, med the medial skin is also much thinner than the lateral skin is, and so it just gives you that thicker skin uh, that covers more of the, more of the area. Um, any femoral neoplastic lesion, you're going to need to do a disarticulation of the coxofemoral joint, which is a little bit more complicated. I used to do disarticulations on all rear limb amputations just out of habit. I have changed that because it is much easier to do a proximal one-third femoral in my opinion. Um, but if you've got a neoplastic femoral lesion, the whole femur needs to come out. Um, you know, sometimes we'll get in, we, if we have proximal femoral lesions, you basically have to do an acetabulectomy as well. So you can remove the acetabulum end block. That gets a little bit different. I don't really talk about hemipelvectomies, but that's another aspect of, of this. Um, if you um, are doing a proximal one-third femoral amputation, make sure you don't leave a, a substantial length of femur out there. I've had at least one case um, where I've seen a bone sticking out of an amputation incision and it was just too long. You know, like that muscle's going to atrophy and then you don't want anything that's pointy in there. You want to make sure you don't have sharp ends to the end of the bone. You know, have it blunted, have it be quite short. Um, femoral artery and vein ligation. So I just go for the femoral artery and vein first. I always do the artery first because um, you know, that's going to prevent you just filling up the leg with blood um, <clears throat> and, and then do the vein. And then I'm attentive of the fact that there can be quite a variability as far as um, vascular anatomy here. I mean, you can see from this image I stole from Miller's that <clears throat> um, there's a number of vessels that are down here. And there is a lot of variability. I've seen a number of dogs that have double femoral arteries, double femoral veins. And so just don't be too cavalier about like you go in there, oh, I got the femoral artery vein, there's nothing else to worry about because those things can be replicated and they can bleed really fast, um, <clears throat> which makes people nervous. Um, so be attentive to that variation there. Just pay it, make sure you got them all ligated before you move on. But I, I go there first. Cautery is helpful here. Um, it doesn't really speed up the process. I think it's just faster if you use scissors, but it certainly minimizes blood loss, et cetera. Um, and then the big lesson I learned um, was if you ever have a male dog that you do a real amputation on, castrate them and do a scrotal ablation if they're intact. Uh, this was actually the first surgery I ever did when I was at Colorado State. Moose Kniebel is this dog's name. <clears throat> and so we did a real amputation with a hemipelvectomy. And one day post-op, this dog was walking around and his scrotum was 
you know, doing this in the hallway <laughs> as I was walking back to ICU. And uh, it was really unpleasant <clears throat> and really embarrassing since I didn't know anybody there yet. Um, and so, yeah, it was just bad. So we had, so if you have an intact male dog, real limb amputation, uh, uh, castration just is mandatory and do a scrotal ablation because it's just the most ventral aspect and it will fill up with fluid and it will be, nobody will be happy. Okay, <clears throat> um, so four limb amputation. So this would not be a good candidate for a full limb amputation right here. Um, so just kind of technically um, for four limbs, I've got a bit of a different way that I do four limb amputations uh, as far as the muscular cut. Um, I'm not sure I can do what I want to do here. Um, man, I thought I was going to be able to use a pointer, but all right, we'll draw the lines. But So I mean, basically do a teardrop incision here. So you have to come around the limb and up right over the spine of the scapula. Um, <clears throat> I always remove the scapula. I think there are people out there that don't. I don't. To me, it's easier. There is no bony attachment of the forelimb to the body, and so it's just easier to remove it all. Um, <clears throat> you typically, you know, you'll do this teardrop incision, and then in in some books it will describe a T or a Y closure. I do not like T or Y closures. It creates these like three incisions that are converging on one another. That, in my hands, has led to lots of focal dehiscence in that spot. And so I, I end up closing these guys in just this long kind of arcing deal. Inevitably, there's going to be a nipple down here that looks weird, but I don't really care. I mean, we want it to heal. We want it to be functional. Um, and that will you know, go away eventually. Um, I do a modification of <clears throat> what, what is typically described for an amputation on the forelimb of dogs. The way it's described, as I remember, I had not gone back and reviewed it actually, but really is to start dorsal, then you come in and you take the trapezius mus muscle off dorsally, and then you're kind of working dorsal and medial to the scapula to go down to get to your vasculature. But if you, <clears throat> and, and, and so you work dorsal to ventral. I think it's much more logical to work ventral to dorsal. And so you go in actually and transect your superficial pectoral muscles and your deep pectoral muscles. And once you do that, then the whole leg just opens up and there's your brachial plexus, your axillary artery and vein, all that vasculature. And it's like right there in front of you as opposed to, you know, the other way you have to have somebody really pull back and you're kind of, you're working in a hole really. And so it is. Uh, at some point we should write this technique up here but like it is clearly superior in my opinion you can just see things so much better it makes the surgery so much easier and you just take those muscles off and it's right there you know kind of logistically uh, you know that's the first maneuver is there and then <clears throat> you really have to attack the front you've got your superficial cervical artery and vein which is a relatively small artery and vein artery, vein, and nerve that are here on the front end that you have to ligate. We typically use hemoclips. And then you've got a lot of this kind of lateral cervical musculature that comes down and attaches. So you've got some muscle to go through. On the back end, there is the thoracodorsal musculature that comes in, and there's a focal um, uh, artery, vein, nerve that comes in as well, which is the one you can use for a vascular pedicle. Like you can use this thoracodorsal vascular pedicle here to transfer tissue around, that sort of thing. So it's relatively robust. Um, but I attack them ventral, you know, go through the front, go through the back, and then just lift them up and everything comes off after that. And, I, and it, it's always kind of brutal to me, quite honestly. Like you get about 80% through it and then you're like, ah, I just, just got to cut this stuff out. And so it's, it's not as pretty as I would like, but it's the way it is. Um, <clears throat> so the ventral technique I think just works really well. I typically bandage these guys for about three days post-op put them in a bandage, leave them there for three days, and then take it off after that. I feel like that that really helps the seroma formation. I have seen some monstrous forelimb amputation seromas, and I don't like them. Um, okay, so limb spare. <clears throat> so limb spare defined is basically you're cutting out the tumor, keeping the leg. I mean, that's probably not the actual definition, but that's the, that's the nuts and bolts of it. Um, Indications for limb spares, and again, what I talked about earlier, is I try to generally avoid um, doing limb spares, but I do them sometimes because some dogs need them. Um, the reasons that some dogs will need them is dogs that have concurrent neurologic disease, dogs that have concurrent orthopedic disease. I did a limb spare on an amputee dog one time that only had three legs already, and so we couldn't take the other one off. Um, 
more often than not, you actually have an owner that comes in and is like, I want to keep this leg. And I won't spend too much time talking them out of it, but I will make certain they know what the downsides of limb spares are, which I'll show you some of those coming up. Like it's just, I, it's 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 a good procedure for those dogs that need it, but um, it's not, it's a headache, you know, is 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 the reality of it. So I get, I generally try to talk people out of it, but for animals that are appropriate candidates and need it, it can be a, a, a good procedure for them. Um, but if you can do an amputation and have a dog that gets around, it is so much simpler. <clears throat> so criteria for limb sparing, and there is a tremendous amount of variability here, and there's a lot of kind of new, new technology and new techniques that you could try to spare a lot of different bones, but for the most part, radius and all the uh, tumors are the ones that we're trying to spare. Um, <clears throat> so these are the mainstays of it. Tibia is really difficult just because of the angle of the tarsus, it makes, uh, it, makes it very hard to have a long-term stability of that bone. Um, with on-site radiation, there are more options for limb spares, and so, I mean, there are procedures like with proximal humeral lesions where you can explant them, so you go cut the bone, rotate it out, take them in, and give them high doses of radiation, intra-op, and then put the bone back in and put a plate on top of it. Those are, and those are pretty far out there. I mean, there's that, you, need a, you need a certain type of a client uh, to, to go for that, and there's high complication rates for that as well. Um, and then we're talking about that stereotactic, stereotactic radiation therapy. That's something that uh, really does hold quite a bit of promise because you can take relatively small lesions and irradiate them if you have a lot of good bone that's left behind and really no, do no surgery on them. Um, uh, if you have a lot of bone loss, it really doesn't work because they just fracture, you know, pretty quickly. Okay. And then there's kind of crazy stuff that goes on. This is this guy named Noel Fitzpatrick, and he, uh, every time I run across anything this guy does, it's like the craziest thing I've ever seen. <clears throat> but, I mean, there you can do any number of things. You can make personalized prosthetics, uh, you know, specific implants. I mean, there, there are any number of options that can be done. And who, who knows? I mean, that may be very much where it's going, um, but there are not a whole lot of options like this now. Okay, so antibrachial limb spares. In general, you need to have less than 50% of the bone that is affected by the tumor. And so there have been several studies that looked at how you judge that. And you can judge it with x-rays, you can judge it with a bone scan, you can judge it with CT, MR. And really what has been shown is that radiographs work as good as anything. Bone scans have a tendency to exaggerate the extent of the lesion. CT can do that as well at some level. Um, and so radiographs are, are well, certainly, certainly what we use here and, and what I think most people are using. Um, you need to have a lesion that has relatively clearly defined margins. If you have these really edematous legs um, that you can't tell where something starts or where something stops, those are not great candidates because it's hard to get the tumor out. Uh, you do not need to have any f pathologic fractures. Um, and then no mets. And again, I mean, you can do anything. I mean, you might have a client that come in that comes in that has a dog has mets, and they are like, "I want a limb spare." And I mean, if somebody was saying that, I would talk to them heavily. But if they really wanted to do it, I would probably be willing to do that. And so, a lot of this is, you know, these criteria. It's not like there's no absolute to this. These are just general logical recommendations. There are a number of options of ways that limbs can be spared. And so in general, when you see lots of options, that means nothing is working real well. It's like there's like 50 different ways to do a cruise ship back in the day. Um, <clears throat> and that is definitely the case for this. And so all these are, radi are radial limb spare techniques. Now you can't have focal ulnar tumors where you just take it out. You don't have to support the leg at all because it's not, it's not the primary weight bearing area. Um, but for radius and ulnar fractures, Cortical allograft is the mainstay of this, and so that's what's imaged here. This is a pancarpal arthrodesis procedure. This is a cortical allograft from another dog that comes from a bone bank. You go and cut the tumor out. You shape this cortical allograft to fit in the space that you took out, um, and then you apply a plate cranially um, that goes all the way from proximal radius down into distal metacarpus. Uh, this is typically filled with bone cement. Um, and this is how the vast majority of limb spares were done early on. Um, a metal spacer is the same concept, but instead of having a cortical allograft, you've got a metal spacer, um, uh, which some people have done uh, just really for logistical reasons. Pasteurized autograft, that's where you cut the tumor out, 
of a dog, stick it in boiling water for 40 minutes or so, and um, kill all the cells in it, stick it back in there. That's an Italian thing. Uh, same, same sort of general, same sort of general, general concept. Um, ipsilateral vascularized ulnar autograph. That's where you can bring the ulna over, and there's three or three different ways to do this to try to you know get rid of the radius. Let's make the ulna be the primary weight bearing area. There's Ilrazov ring fixators, which uh, really interesting and had shown a lot of promise, but. So for lesions like this, say for example, you can cut out this section and then uh, do a bone transport. So you can take a segment of the proximal, the distal aspect of the proximal, proximal segment, cut off a little section of it, and then put a ring fixture on it, transport it down and grow a new bone. <clears throat> that in theory sounds really good, but it takes a long time and these dogs are on chemo, it's just, it's just hard to do, you know, kind of logistically. And so you can do it, but it's not, it's not commonly performed. This is what it looks like. Um, <clears throat> takes about six months. It's just, it's a lot of short-term stuff. All right, so what I'm doing currently is what's called a Manus lateralization procedure, which is showing pretty good promise. I've got, this is the last dog we did here, which is the only dog we've done here. Um, <clears throat> and so this tumor right here, this is a dog named Susie, Great Pyrenees, um, focal, you know, less than 50% of the bone, very well defined um, tumor, no fractures, no mets on this dog. And so we did a limb spare on her. And this is the procedure. And so this is where we just cut the tumor out. So you can see where we've got the, the radius is taken out here all the way down the joint. And then we actually do a dual plate on it. And so this is a standard limb spare plate. You have to, it's a specialty order deal. It's really long, it's got a lot of screws. And it goes down, it's two seven screws here, three five screws approximately. And then this is a three five SOP plate, which is a string of pearls plate. It's a locking, locking plate. The advantage of this thing is that you can contour it in three directions. And so you can have it on the cranial aspect of the metacarpus here, and then torque it and put it on the lateral aspect of the hole up top. This is, they've, they've done, there's been about nine dogs that have had this done. The real advantage of this is that is, this is strong <clears throat> because you've got, uh, implants in two different planes, and these things have a tendency to stand up uh, to the test of time. So, this is Susie. I gotta go back to my videos. Um, I've got two videos of her. One um, immediately post op, and, and this is real typical for any limb spare. I mean, they'll come out and they're walking. You know, they, they've got a limp, but she, I think this is one day post-op. It might be two, but I'm pretty sure it was one because I think I did the video because I was like, wow, look at that. Um, <clears throat> but using the leg pretty well, you know, seemed pretty comfortable. These guys are going to have big bandages on for several days. Um, we put little hearts on them. Um, and uh, so, like, immediately pretty functional, you yeah, know, one day post-op. And then I've got um, just another video, pretty much the same look, same appearance. Um, and this is two weeks post-op, so we don't end up, I didn't end up even putting a splint on her. This thing structurally is so sound that I feel like you can get away without doing that. Um, <clears throat> and you know, she's got a noticeable limp, but putting the foot down, um, she doesn't have any range of motion in her carpus because she's got an arthrodesis, but very comfortable, very functional. Um, Dad's real happy. Dad's happy, I'm happy. Susie, 18 months out, um, um, I mean, actually, I'm pretty happy with it. I mean, this is our leg. She is exteriorizing her implants. And so this is what will happen. These guys get infected and you have big implants in, they will start to exteriorize it. So their skin will grow up under the implants, which, <clears throat> I mean, my gut instinct is like, ah. But, I mean, she's walking on this like great. Um, he just has to keep a bandage on the top of it. And um, she's 18 months out now. She's been very comfortable. She's running around the backyard. He's pretty happy. and. I don't necessarily think it's the worst outcome. You know, if, and, and these implants are radiographed at that point, like nothing's moving, very solid. So I was pretty happy with it. Um, as a side note, I think Jared's gonna talk about infections. I mean, this, it's got infected basically. And infection can be a good thing. Uh, it has been shown to have a high trend toward increasing uh, survival times in dogs with, with uh, uh, osteosarcomas. That infectious process stimulates the immune system. I don't understand. I can't believe there's not 100 papers on it already. Um, <clears throat> but it's something that's shown repeatedly for the limb spirits. When they get infected, those dogs have a tendency to live longer, substantially longer. Um, 
so that's kind of where we are. <clears throat> so as far as limb spare complications go, um, it's pretty big. 50% of them will become infected. I think it seems like it's even more than that for me. But um, <clears throat> So 50%. And when they get infected, you got wounds and antibiotics and bandages, and it just goes on and on and on and on. And so that's why it's very important to communicate that on the front end. Um, <clears throat> the reason you get infected, you got avascular grafts, lots of implants. You know, heavy soft tissue dissection, minimal soft tissue coverage. And you have these dogs on chemo, so like, how could they not get infected? 27% um, are reported to have local recurrences. Um, this 11% implant failure. I've, I've seen a lot of implant failures. That's why I like this later, mantis lateralization. But this is kind of my my mind's image of a limb spare prior to these mantis lateralizations. Is the proximal screws have a tendency to break down. You're going, trying to go back in and hold it all together. It's just a mess. So I actually like the like this procedure. I hope it hope it stands up for a little while. Okay, so just kind of summary. I think I probably talked too long, <clears throat> but um, um, the need for tissue sampling I think is dependent on specific circumstances. Um, you know, cytology. I'm a big advocate for it over histopathology most of the time. Um, Sometimes you need to do a biopsy. Partic focal lesions, ones that you're not really sure exactly what's going on, I'm an advocate for biopsying those. Amputation is the cornerstone of surgical treatments. Limb spare is useful in certain circumstances, but still has some shortcomings. And I think there's a lot on the horizon. And, and Jared will talk about a lot of like medical options on the horizon. I think there's also going to be some surgical options, especially with the stereotactic radiation therapy. Um, so I, I think there's more to come. No, there's only two places that I'm aware of, uh, Colorado and Florida. It's a really expensive deal. I mean, it's basically a linear <laughs> accelerator, and it has to be on this huge gantry where it can rotate like in any direction. It's like crazy expensive, crazy, crazy expensive. Have you run into a problem getting just necrotic bowel on these biopsies at all? Not it's really. been a while. Yeah. That seems like I ran into several years. We would do a core biopsy and it would just come back as it may have been the library, I don't know, but just necrotic mild is what I would get. Yeah. Um, you certainly see how that could occur. <clears throat> My experience has been pretty positive. Um, and again, I've aspirated the vast majority of them. I feel like that that's why, you know, looking at your samples, you know, being able to do some basic cytology is really important. Being able to, you know, make slides that are readable and, you know, screening them for the biopsy samples, I think it's a little more difficult, you know. I f that's when I was saying like you want to make sure you look at your sample and does that look like bone or does that look like a blood clot and I think you can probably improve your chances with that but I mean it definitely could happen it's not been personally a big problem so in this second part of this hour or the second part of the tonight we're going to talk about the uh, the secondary disease the metastatic disease and so as we spoke about there in the first half, obviously this tumor um, has two major issues with it, or this disease has two major issues with it. First, the local primary osteosarcoma, and then certainly the secondary potential for secondary metastasis. So when we start talking about secondary metastasis, the, the first thing we need to really talk about is the most common site we see it go, and that is the pulmonary parenchyma into the lungs. This is certainly, without a doubt, the most likely place you will see osteosarcoma uh, metastasized to. It's actually, however, very uncommon to see, or at least somewhat uncommon, to see pulmonary nodules at the time of diagnosis. And, and there's a couple reasons for this. The biggest reason is, is that we actually detect these, these tumors fairly early in the disease process. These dogs are lame, they're uncomfortable, uh, you may have a swelling there, but that lameness is the one thing that a lot of owners will pick up on. They're taking their dogs for walks, they're taking their dogs to the park to play, and if these guys come up lame, they're going to get them in to get them checked out. So a lot of these tumors we do detect earlier than some masses that may be in the thorax or the abdomen or even on the side and they say, well, I just, I just noticed that there's a big giant mass on this side. This lameness they're going to pick up fairly early. The other thing is that these nodules in the lungs are soft tissue density. They're not, even though they're coming from bone, they're osteosarcoma, they're, they're pretty uncommon to actually be calcified. So most of them are soft tissue and density. When we look at how big uh, these nodules have to be to be radiographic apparent, you can look at several different uh, several different papers, but somewhere between about six to eight millimeters uh, in, in size is what they have to be to, to pick them up on radiographs. In humans, and in some cases in dogs, we will do a CT scan as a metastatic check. Um, that will increase your sensitivity, and you can start to pick up nodules as small as three millimeters in, in those cases. But 
you do have to have a fairly tangible nodule to show up on radiographs. Now most of these guys certainly have, have metastatic cells circulating throughout their, their bloodstream and maybe some that have already localized to the pulmonary parenchyma. They've just not turned into a tangible nodule yet. So less than 10% of patients at diagnosis will have evidence of pulmonary metastasis. However, that's real important and the next thing you say to an owner when you say, hey, there's no evidence of pulmonary metastasis, which is really good initially here, but we definitely need to talk about what the potential is down the road. And that potential is, again, greater than 90%. So during the disease process, 90% of these guys will go on to develop secondary uh, pulmonary metastasis. So here's some images of what some things would look like when we're looking at pulmonary metastasis. The, fir the first image here is a, is a CT scan image. Um, this is a single slice. You can see that there's the soft tissue to density nodules found in multiple nodules in the, in the lung field. And then when we look at the radiographic image, this is more of those fluffy, large sarcoma, sarcoma type uh, metastatic nodules found within the lungs. Now other than the lungs, we can also see metastasis go to things like the spine um, or other parts of the skeleton as well as the skin. The top lesion, the uh, top uh, radiograph there is a, is a lytic lesion in the, in the vertebral column. This would be very similar to what you could see with some uh, metastatic osteosarcoma to the spine. And then the, the guy here on the bottom, this is actually an a, a, a image of metastatic osteosarcoma to the soft tissue. Now, you definitely can see uh, soft tissue metastasis with osteosarcoma, and it is, a, it is a pretty guarded prognosis when you see this. It's, it's fairly challenging to treat. The image here on the far side is a nuclear scintigraphy or bone scan of a dog with diffuse osteosarcoma metastasis. I want to talk a little bit about nuclear scintigraphy, and I mentioned it in the first half, and so just to kind of give you guys a little bit of an idea of what that is, when you would use it, and what are some of the pros and cons to it. So nuclear scintigraphy, or, or a bone scan as we roughly refer to it, is, um, is using a radio pharmaceutical or radioactive isotope called technetium-99 MDP. Now this is a, a radioactive isotope that is a gamma ray emitting isotope so you can actually image it uh, with a gamma camera. It actually will detect very early abnormal bone changes. The benefits to this is that this will actually detect changes before they are radiographically apparent. Uh, it also is a really good way to image the entire skeleton without taking multiple, multiple radiographs. It's got ex exquisite sensitivity, so any region of osteoblastic activity will enhance. That can be a good thing and a bad thing, so you're going to pick up on really, really early bony changes or bony lesions, but the downside to it is you're also going to pick up on chronic arthritis, old fractures, sites of trauma, um, lots of other things that are not skeletal tumors. So the specificity on this is fairly low. It's not going to just identify skeletal tumors, but any kind of occult bone lesion. That's okay, you just have to keep it in, in mind when you're looking at images so you can interpret them better. So when we look at some images here of, uh, of bone scans in dogs, the wider images here on the side, you can see, and you've got, now obviously with this guy, you've got multiple sites throughout the ribs here. Now these aren't going to be sites of just chronic osteoarthritis, uh, but, and you're seeing various lesions throughout that whole skeleton. Same thing with this guy. So this would be more representative of a diffuse pulmonary, or diffuse skeletal metastasis with osteosarcoma. Now if you had a dog that had a primary lesion, you did a bone scan and you only saw something like this right here, at the elbow, a little bit of an uncommon place to see osteosarcoma, and could this be osteoarthritis? Could this be metastasis? Yeah, it could be either one. The big thing on this is you'd have to just investigate it further. So you're going to have to zoom in on it. You maybe take some more radiographs of that image, or go in and sample it. And as, as Dr. Kalfi mentioned in the first part, certainly doing fine needle aspiration in a case like this could be beneficial. Doing cytology on it. Um, one thing I wanted to add to that is is the simple fact that, that obviously uh, sometimes when you take radiographs you're going to see a real lytic lesion and be able to go in to aspirate it. If not, you can also do, use ultrasound to help increase your sensitivity and aspiration. So you could put an ultrasound probe on that and maybe guide yourself a little better when you take, take cytology. But, but again, increased sensitivity going to pick up a lot in a, in diffusely through the whole skeleton, um, but, but a little bit of a lower specificity on that. So 
Looking at the treatment plan for osteosarcoma, again, we're just kind of driving this point home tonight a little bit more, and that's the fact that it's always a two-fold treatment plan. You're going to have to address that local bone destruction as well as that potential for secondary metastasis. It simply said, any failure to address both aspects is going to result in a decrease in prognosis and treatment success. If we go in and just do an amputation, these guys in a few months are going to de develop metastasis. If we just did chemotherapy, they're going to be painful, uncomfortable, and be euthanized for, for that particular aspect. So when we look at treating the local disease or the primary tumor, Realistically, this is going to be certainly the most important to just get good quality of life. The whole goal of this is to improve the quality of life, make that pet comfortable, and certainly um, get him back to hopefully acting normal and, and, and interacting with his family without too many issues. When we look at metastatic disease or secondary metastasis, this is going to be focused at adding quantity now to that patient who has quality of life. I wanted to start with this part right here, and this part is where we are today. Um, obviously, later on, I'm going to talk more and more about the future and where we're going and where we can be going, but where we are today is actually pretty dang good. I don't think a lot of people realize what we can achieve with osteosarcoma. So if we do, and I just put amputation, but certain limb spare is going to fit right into that number as well. Um, surgical therapy for a local tumor followed by conventional chemotherapy uh, using one of our more common uh, chemotherapy agents, which I'll discuss in a minute. Our median survival time, about 50% of these guys is going to get out to one year. 25% actually will go to two years. So that means a quarter of the patients we treat for this disease with surgical intervention and conventional chemotherapy will live two years with the disease. And I see that. I definitely see that. that that's real. So that is, that, that's I, in my opinion, I mean, I think in a dog, and certainly some of the large dogs, giant breed dogs that get this, that's a big, that's a big number. And then you have 10% of these guys that will actually make it out to three years with the disease. So this is a disease, in my opinion, that's, that's extremely worth treating. So where are we going? Well, conventional chemotherapy, we've kind of messed with it, messed with it, messed with it over the last, you know, several, several years, and we get pretty stuck at these numbers. So it's improbable that other conventional chemotherapy agents is going to improve over these numbers. The future is going to be combining other therapies with cytotoxic therapy, things like immunotherapy, molecular targeted therapy, anti-angiogenic therapy. These are, these are where we're going to go to get these numbers even higher than they are right now. So again, local therapy, quality of life, uh, secondary metastatic therapy is going to be looking to increase the quantity on that quality. So what are some potential targets to treat an osteosarcoma medically? Well, the first one is going to be the tumor cells. That's where we've, we've always started with treating cancers. Going in, conventional chemotherapy, the whole role of that in most cases is to attack these tumor cells and destroy them. Other factors or other things that we can target are growth factors. So growth factors are, are uh, signaling mechanisms that promote replication of cells. If we can block those growth factors from binding to the tumor cell, we can slow down uh, basically the replication of those cells. So the idea behind growth factors, blood vessels, and the immunity that I'm going to go over here is really focused basically at after you've done conventional chemotherapy and destroyed what cells you can, how do you prevent those surviving cells from replicating? Inhibiting growth factors is one way. Inhibiting blood vessels is another. So anti-angiogenic therapy, the whole idea is that a cancer cell can only get about two millimeters to three millimeters away from a blood vessel before it starts losing oxygen supply, nutrient supply, so it's just not going to be able to replicate. To make that tumor better, to form that metastatic nodule, you really got to lay down new blood vessels. And if we can prevent that or slow that down, you're going to slow how long it takes for metastasis to occur. And then anti-tumor immunity, as Dr. Calfee was saying there, with some of these guys that got infected and we know the immune system really ramped up, we had slowing, significant slowing of metastatic disease. Those guys live longer. So boosting the immune system, as we've seen with diseases like the melanoma vaccine and melanoma, can certainly slow how long it takes for a tumor to metastasize and how long it takes for those metastatic nodules to form. The standard of care right now, which, which basically if you define that as his treatment option is accepted to provide the longest median survival time. What's proven? Well, surgical resection of the tumor, amputation or limb spare, followed by anywhere from four to six cycles of an adjunctive chemotherapy. This is just a huge number of papers that I pulled and looked at. 
those are going to be pretty consistent in, in what we expect, expect right now is what your standard of care is, has pretty consistent overall survival times, which we'll go over. The most common drugs we use for this disease is platinum agents. Uh, the first drug we used was the first generation platinum agent called cisplatin. Uh, a lot of you guys remember it. It was a good drug. It really improved the survival time for a lot of patients with osteosarcoma. Had a lot of negative things to it. It was nephrotoxic. It was difficult to give. You had to put them on a significant diuresis the whole time they got it. It was highly emetic. Almost all the patients that got it vomited within an hour or two of getting it. Um, and, and overall, I guess the, the, the biggest thing was is that it was just a, it was a difficult drug to handle, difficult drug to do, uh, do much with. So a second generation platinum agent was tried to was invented called carboplatin. Everybody's familiar with this drug. Uh, it definitely has addressed a lot of those problems. It's less nephrotoxic. It has comparable tumor effects um, to cisplatin or anti-tumor effects of cisplatin, it's nowhere near as gastrointestinal uh, toxicity is nowhere near as high. Neutropenia is its dose limit in toxicity. And the survival times with this drug after you follow a patient or with the surgical intervention of the local disease followed with carboplatin, it ranges anywhere from 257 to 371. So that's going to be what those papers show. And, and typically what we see there uh, is about that year median survival time. This is the most common adjunctive therapy that, that we use here or I use for uh, starting out with, um, with a dog with, uh, with osteosarcoma after they have surgical intervention. Again, cisplatin is not significantly better than that and it's just a much more challenging drug to handle. Third generation platinum agents are now being created to try to improve on that. The first one I mentioned is just very similar to Carbo called Loboplatin. Now, Loboplatin was created with one simple purpose, and that is to be better than Carbo. The problem was when we used it in dogs, clinical trial was done with 28 dogs, we just didn't see that. Amputation plus Loboplatin, we didn't get the 50% to one year. We got more like 32%. So good drug, but, but you're not going to hear much about it because it just didn't ever show to be better than Carboplatin, um, and so it kind of fell to the wayside. A third generation, though, that is gaining a lot of head esteem and is shown to be significantly um, uh, exciting, I guess, at this point, is a drug called satroplatin. Now, satroplatin, again, third generation platinum agent, it's actually an orally given drug, so the ease of administration is getting even better. Uh, it's highly lipophilic, it's bioavailable, it can be taken orally. Uh, Neutropenia is a stoslimin toxicity, so even though it's oral, we don't see a lot of vomiting or diarrhea with it. These are actually what they look like. This is them right here. Clinical trial is ongoing right now. There's a couple of different universities that are using this drug. I mean, it is obtainable. If we decided to use it, I could get this drug. Initial data on the six dogs they've treated so far, they've received an amputation and satroplatin. Very exciting. We, we get, these dogs are getting out to about 659 days right now in median survival time. The problem with satroplatin right now, um, even though we can get it, it's financially it's a little bit demanding. That is expected to, uh, to improve. Carboplatin, when it first came out, was really expensive, uh, and it improved very quickly to a, a much more acceptable number. So if these numbers hold up, six dogs is a low, low population right now, so we need to get those numbers up in the, in the 25 to 30 range. But if it holds up, this could, this could be the drug we start to use for osteosarcoma as a, as a first line. So third generation right now are, are being developed. Second generation carboplatin is what we're typically using. Some people ask me all the time about what about adding doxorubicin to carboplatin. Definitely did that for a couple years. Uh, it's just not shown to make much of a difference. Uh, initially, we started giving carbo and doxorubicin actually on the exact same day concurrently. Uh, scared a lot of people, but they actually handled it pretty well. We just had to lower the dosages too much, and so to, for it to be tolerable, uh, again, both drugs, their efficacy was lower too much, and the survival time stayed the same. Then we alternated them, high dose carbo, three weeks later high dose dox, three weeks later high dose carbo. Again, the numbers stayed in that same right around that year mark, didn't really get a whole lot better. The only thing in my opinion doxorubicin does when added to carbo is you can have more dogs have GI toxicity with it. They can, more dogs get nauseous, more dogs have diarrhea. It doesn't really improve, so I just go with single line carbo and put my efforts in some of these other things that we're going to talk about here in a minute, which is combining other types of therapy with conventional chemo. So what are those new options? What are some of these new medical therapies that we can start to add with our typical cytotoxic chemotherapy to bump this thing past one to two years? 
Starting out, I was going to give you just these, first, these next couple of slides are just to give you an idea of the thought process behind adding in things like molecular targeted therapy. These therapies are not targeted against the cancer cell per se. They're targeted against some unique little factor that we feel helps promote cancer cells to replicate. In humans, they, they, they see a pretty high elevation, for an example, in growth hormone and insulin-like growth factor. Now, the reason for that is that human osteosarcoma has its peak occurrence, again, in that juvenile patient, and that's usually during childhood, again, and coincides with this growth hormone uh, spike. In large and giant breed dogs, we also see a growth hormone or insulin-like growth, uh, growth factor spike. So certainly there is some suspicion that maybe that those factors actually do play a role in pathogenesis. So a clinical trial was done with 44 dogs, and they used a, a drug called Oncolar, and basically it's a somatostatin analog, which is going to help reduce insulin-like growth factor in patients. Amputation and carbo plus Oncolar, or Oncolar, amputation and carbo plus a placebo. We did see a 43% decrease in insulin-like growth factor, but really didn't see an uh, improvement in median survival time. So this one was not as exciting. We didn't replicate what they saw in humans with it. Uh, but, but one of the things that now is being looked at is maybe we targeted the wrong number of dogs or the wrong dog population in general because this is juvenile osteosarcoma. We do see that same peak in dogs, that 18 to 24 month. And so now they're going back and they're going to try to use Oncolar only against patients that are in that juvenile range. They have to be less than two years of age. We may see then this drug makes a bigger difference when it decreases insulin-like growth factor. So again, just to kind of give you an idea of what's out there. Another real important um, uh, molecular target that we see with metastasis is something called uh, matrix metalloproteinase or matrix metallopeptidase. MMP2 and MMP9, these are actually just enzymes and their whole, their, and when it comes to metastasis, their whole job is it helps get a, the, the metastatic cancer cell that's breaking off of that primary tumor, migra help get it from the tumor into the vasculature, and then as this metastatic cell circulates through the vascular, it helps it get out of the vascular into the pulmonary parenchyma and localize in the lung. These enzymes help with that invasion process. So the idea was if we can block these enzymes, MMP2 and 9, then it's going to be very difficult for these cells, one, to break off the tumor and actually get in the vessels, but two, when they're in the vessels and the tumor's already been amputated, it's going to make them hard to get out of the vessels and form nodules in the lungs. So a big trial was done, 223 dogs, and they gave these guys a, a drug called Bay-12, and Bay-12 is supposed to block MM2 and MM, or MM2 MMP2 and MMP9. Gave it with amputation in this case, even though I said don't use docs, they use docs. Uh, amputation and docs in Bay 12 and amputation docs in a placebo. There just wasn't any statistical significance in these. Problem was, is Bay 12 just didn't work. Uh, it didn't really lower MMP at all. So it's not that this is not still a legitimate target. Just the study that was done, the drug just wasn't very effective at, at reducing MMP. So they're actually creating right now in, in oncology, we're actually looking at creating better, more targeted uh, MMP uh, inhibitors. And if we do see that, we, this may still be a, a legitimate target for us. So there's a couple things that really didn't do much. So here's something that actually does do something. So molecular targeted therapy right now, what do we have available to us that works? Well, tyrosine kinase inhibitors is something that a lot of people have heard a big buzz about in the last few years. The drug Palladia or Tocirinib is one of these tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Heavily marketed to treat mast cell tumors in dogs but it doesn't actually treat the mast cell. What it does is it blocks the receptor on mast cells that these growth factors bind to that I was talking about earlier. So the idea behind this is that if we can inhibit those growth factors, there are a variety of cancers where things like vascular endothelial growth factor, platelet-derived growth factor, stem cell growth factor called CKIT, if inhibited, will reduce how fast or, or how readily uh, cells are replicating. Osteosarcoma is definitely one of those diseases. These factors play a pretty big role in how fast uh, tumor cells are replicating in osteosarcoma. So tocirinib or palladia has been used uh, as a second-line therapy in cells that, in patients we know have metastasis. How it's being used right now and, and how I like to use it in patients is They've received their surgical intervention to treat the local disease. They've went through carboplatin, and they're going out. They get 10 months to a year out, and they develop a pulmonary nodule. 
Well, then we put them on palladia as a second-line therapy to inhibit the reproduction or the, help, or the replication of these established metastatic nodules. A clinical study done, was done with 23 dogs with gross metastasis. They gave this drug Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 2.7. The reason I mention this is because the label actually states to give it at 3.25 every other day, but we know that it, you don't have to get that high. If you go that high, all you're going to do is increase toxicity and not efficacy. So the label is a little bit wrong on this, and they're just not going to go back and change it. This is, this is the, where we're using it right now. 14 of the 23 patients that received this drug had stable 2 improved disease. And what we saw with that, so that's about a 60 to 61% improvement. So that's, that's pretty remarkable with those dogs. These are secondary, these are dogs that have gross pulmonary metastasis from osteosarcoma. What's my personal experience with it? It's really good. So I've had a couple patients that have come in, had visible pulmonary metastasis at the time, at, a, at some undefined point in their disease process. We started an omnipladia, and two of these dogs had actually resolution of the pulmonary metastasis where they were not any longer radiographically apparent. One of those dogs had resolution for up to eight months, and then he started to see the nodules reoccur, and the other one had it for 12 months, and we started to see it reoccur. So that, to me, was really exciting. I never had seen that before. I'd never seen actual nodules to that degree go completely away with a drug. And so in Palladia, definitely my favorite thing right now is a second-line therapy for osteosarc, and I think it's something that you'll hear a lot more about in the future. And there are more trials going on right now with this, with this medication in osteosarcoma. No, no, no. It comes in tens, fifteens, and fifty or tens, fifteens, and fifties. Yeah. So, when we look at the next option we have, well, it's it's the anti-angiogenic that I'd mentioned, inhibiting those blood vessels so these tumors really are slowed down. Now, this isn't going to probably make metastasis go away. Um, this is going to just make it very difficult for a tumor cell to continue to or to continue to replicate and enlarge because they need to make blood vessels so they can continue to get bigger. Metronomic therapy is basically defined as just low dose frequently, uh, frequent administration of some particular drug. The idea is just to keep a continuous low level of drug in your body at all time. The drugs we typically use is cyclophosphamide or cytoxin, an NSAID. I use Lasix anytime I'm using cytoxin with it. Uh, the goal with that is just to reduce any kind of cystitis or bladder side effects that can be seen with cytoxin. Um, and some people still use doxycycline as to, to help reduce uh, some of our... Um, Oh, so some of the secondary uh, resistance that can be built up with these drugs. Lomustine and chlorambucil, two other oral uh, alkylating agents or chemotherapy agents that we use, can also be uh, compounded down and used on a, on a frequently daily dose. Uh, so these are the ones we typically use. Again, the idea is just slow blood vessel formation, slow down how fast those tumors can grow or metastatic nodules can grow. Metronomic therapy also has a secondary mechanism and it actually boosts the immune system. A lot of people don't know this, but this is, this is something that metronomic therapy actually will do. The way it does it is it by it reduces down the, uh, a cell in your body called T-regulatory cells or T-regs. T-regs do just that. They regulate how active your immune system can be. You don't want to have an overactive immune system and T-regulatory cells help to keep it in check. When we put these guys on metronomic therapy, though, it actually will reduce down Tregs and allow your immune system to really respond actively. In the case of a neoplastic uh, a population of cells, your immune system can be real beneficial. So knocking down your Tregs and allowing your body to boost that immune system up, it'll do it on its own, is something that has shown to be some benefits. And we think it goes along with what Dr. Calfee was saying about um, the infection. We think that that's going to help him kick that immune system up. So this can be beneficial. Where I like to use this is we do the amputation or limb spare. They go through their carboplatin. They've not developed metastasis. Well, then I'll put them on metronomic as just a maintenance at home, helping keep their immune system up, helping slow down any of these cells that are there to try to reproduce. And then if they do develop metastasis, I can toss in the palladia down the road as their rescue. Now, the reason I like to do it versus just start and play right, right away, palladia is costly, has more side effects, metronome extremely well tolerated in most patients, and at the end of the day, it's not very expensive for patients to be on long term. So what are the other ways you can boost your immune system? There, there are a couple things I wanted to mention. One is called IL-2. IL-2 is just a cytokine in your body that's responsible to, for the activities of some of your leukocytes in the, in the field of immunity. Um, IL-2, when you're given IL-2, it can certainly increase your immune response or your immune system response. The first study that was done in dogs, there was only four dogs, and they gave them nebulization of IL-2 through direct pulmonary delivery. 
Um, those guys had some pretty exciting responses. Two of them went out for 12 to 20 months with their metastatic nodule staying real stable or improving. So we know the immune system in that case really did help keep it regulated. The problem was is this is a really hard drug to give through nebulization. It wasn't a very easy thing to do. That's why we only did four dogs. So they said, okay, let's scratch that and let's just give it IV. Well, that didn't work. So three of the 20 dogs really responded. Um, we only had one that had a real good solid CR and the, the lesions did resolve in and also had some side effects. So fever and leukogram changes that weren't real desirable. So IL-2 never really caught on. It does work and if it ever, they ever figure out a way to really deliver it in a more uh, easy and tolerable fashion, uh, then it may be something you hear more about. The most common immunotherapy option that we have that does work is something called mural tripeptide. So liposomal encapsid mural tripeptide has been around for a while. Uh, it's most well, I guess it's the most well documented, again, immune uh, stimulant for osteosarcoma. This drug is actually heavily, heavily used in human childhood osteosarcoma. So heavily used that they, it's actually difficult to get for people, if you're adults with osteosarcoma, and it's very difficult for uh, veterinarians to get it as a, uh, for a dog because it, it's, it's kind of coveted and used only for kids with osteosarc because it does work. Um, it's actually a synthetic analog of a macrobacterium cell wall. And the whole way it works is it ramps up your macrophage production to go in and help with some tumor tumorcidal properties and reduce down the tumor cells. There was a clinical trial done um, at Wisconsin, uh, Madison, Wisconsin. They, they basically gave dogs, uh, and this was several years ago, amputation, cisplatin, carboplatin wasn't even out at the point where they did this, followed them with mural tripeptide, and these guys got a survival time of around 15 months, 14 and a half months. Um, when they did the same patients without the tripeptide, they were only knocking at about 9.8. So that, that's pretty good. That was, about, that was almost a five-month difference between those two populations. It was significant, and it was a significant number of dogs. Everybody wanted to use it, and then they took it off and, and wouldn't let us have it anymore. There is some thought process right now that this is going to become more readily available. There's a company that's trying to get the, the rights to it to start producing it. If it does, then, then certainly uh, this will be something you will hear about us using in, in dogs, and, and we will try to use it as much as possible because it does help boost the immune system and has been shown to be efficacious. When we look at uh, uh, the next thing here that I want to talk about, metastatic disease, Originally, when I was going through school, they, they sat down and they told us, you know, if a dog has osteosarcoma and he de develops diffuse pulmonary metastasis, it's probably not worth doing too much about. Uh, that guy is going to continue to progress, and, and it's not really worth treating. Well, that's just absolutely wrong now, and we see lots and lots of opportunity at treating these patients with uh, gross metastatic disease in all kinds of cancers, and particularly in osteosarcoma. So I wanted to kind of go over that just to kind of give you some ideas of options. You're probably going to see a patient at some point that has diffuse metastatic disease and their owners are going to say, so is there, there any hope? Is there any opportunity out there? Well, there is. So obviously I talked about Palladia, two dogs that I've had that the Mets went away in and they had sustainable uh, resolution for 8 to 12 months on those couple dogs. Metronomic therapy, certainly an ability to slow it down. I think those dogs, again, you're not going to see the metastasis go away, but you're going to see the tumor slow down, the, the metastasis slow down. And then you still have conventional cytotoxic rescue drugs. So just like if a dog comes out of remission from lymphoma, you can come in there and you can rescue them with other, uh, other uh, chemotherapy agents. Paclitaxel. Is a, is a chemotherapy agent uh, that you may not have heard a whole lot about. It's a drug used for carcinomas in humans, uh, used for breast, uh, mammary carcinoma, breast cancer, as well as pancreatic carcinoma and a, a variety of other, other tumors in, in humans. There has been a clinical trial using paclitaxel as a rescue agent, nine dogs. Two of the nine dogs did, after developed pulmonary metastasis, go on and have a partial response for greater than 50% reduction in their disease. This is a, a very uh, feasible drug for us to use here at MVS, and certainly one that I keep in my mind. If we're not responding to Palladia, then I still got this option. So as you can see, we're, we're, not, we're not stonewalled on this. We do have options to try to kind of help get these guys as much time as possible. Pretty well tolerated, um, and certainly, in my opinion, not, not too terribly demanding or expensive to use. My favorite drug to use as rescue is a combination of carboplatin and gemcitabine. And some people will say, well, you use carboplatin on the, uh, as your first line. Now, why would you come back and use carboplatin again? Well, carboplatin and gemcitabine actually work in a synergistic uh, manner. One is going to inhibit, um, or one's going to damage your DNA, and the other is going to inhibit repair of that DNA. So you're going to have much more of your sublethal damage to your cells go ahead and become lethal. 
Gemcitabine has been shown in, in several studies to be efficacious in vitro as well as in vivo against multiple canine osteosarcoma cell lines. And now that we know how to use it, um, we, we definitely see some efficacious uh, or efficacy in using it. So I actually did a little... I guess non-published clinical trial a couple years ago and treated several dogs as rescue agent with carboplatin and gemcitabine. And we treated six dogs total and had a real good response. And these patients had all had an amputation, went through carboplatin or went through carboplatin and doxorubicin or doxorubicin alone, and then came in and was rescued with carboplatin and gemcitabine. All of them had pulmonary metastasis, and we did give this at a little bit more of a high dose than, than what was typically recommended. What we found was is that it was extremely well tolerated. Dogs actually did very, very well with it, and that, and that was my biggest concern. Um, it was given concurrently at the, on the same day, uh, and we did see a pretty good response in, in terms of a lot of these dogs getting out for at least another six months, which was, which was pretty good. One dog I wanted to mention was Reno, and, and the reason I mention is because this dog was awesome. I mean, he was one of those guys that just always sticks out in your mind that you just really, really like. So he was a seven-year-old Burmy, had a proximal tibia, osteosarcoma, received uh, an amputation, went forward with carboplatin, and Adria is his initial line, alternating. He got three, three carbos, three Adrias, and then developed pulmonary metastasis right at the 12-month uh, mark. We did rescue him with Carbo and Jim as his second line, and he actually, his disease was, as soon as I took radiographs, I mean, they were progressing, and, and they had, we had seen a little knowledge, and we thought, well, hopefully that's not going to be anything, and then boom, it came up, and there was a lot of them. We started this and, and, and took radiographs. His mom was awesome. She let me take radiographs every couple months, and we took radiographs and was able to document him. He had less than 25% increase in, on all his uh, sequential radiographs, stable disease, basically, Progressive pulmonary disease wasn't noted till another 12 months. Um, he was extremely happy, always had a great quality of life, ran around on three legs like nobody's business, and at 12 months we did start to say, you know, he's now having progressive disease and just decided at that point that we weren't going to do anything else. He went on and was, it was about 24 months there is, is from amputation is when uh, we decided to let him go. Literally normal on a Wednesday and then Thursday he just didn't want to eat, didn't want to get up and you could tell he was having some issues and was starting to build some fluid up in his lungs from the, the tumors. So we did euthanize him at that point. But he, he had a really good response. And the thing I just drive home is just, I mean, he got another 12 months from those pulmonary metastatic nodules, which is awesome. I mean, that's just great. So the last thing I'll, I'll talk about is just kind of a new technique. We talked about nebulization of IL-2, but aerosol chemotherapy is being looked at really heavily right now in oncology as an option of delivery. You know, we've done oral, we've done uh, intracavitary, we've done obviously IV. Now we're looking at aerosolization. The reason is, is because there's a marked absorptive property of your pulmonary parenchyma. A lot of things that you give through nebulization or aerosol um, is heavily absorbed by the, by the pulmonary cells. So. With osteosarcoma, that's perfect because that is our most common site of metastasis. That's where we see these tumors go. So when we give this in humans, it's very, very well tolerated. So the hypothesis was, well, in dogs, would it be very efficacious and would it be very well tolerated? So a study was done. There was only six dogs, again, because it is a, a, a kind of an unusual technique. Uh, we used doxorubicin and then, again, paclitaxel, that drug that I was talking about as a rescue, Every two weeks, I got six treatments, three, three treatments of docs, three treatments of paclitaxel. What we found was it was extremely well tolerated, even at very, very high doses. They were really going at some numbers that, that would scare most people. Um, and two out of the six dogs did have a, a really nice partial response with greater, greater than 50% uh, reduction. One dog's response actually lasted for over 325 days. So this is definitely something we're looking more into in the oncology world right now to see if aerosolization can be used for this drug or this, this disease as well as things like uh, hemangiosarcoma and other highly pulmonary metastatic diseases. The only thing that was really noticed, I mean, these guys actually did extremely well. They didn't get very neutropenic. They didn't have a lot of uh, uh, GI toxicity. At necropsy, when these guys were euthanized, they did take the lungs and look at them, and they just noticed that there was a pretty marked pneumonitis and, and, and interstitial fibrosis. So that is something at least that it wasn't clinical in this setting. It was a rescue. But if we started to use this, this is something we got to keep in mind if we start to use it as a first-line therapy for delivery because does that mean these guys are going to get a year and a half, two years out and start to have a lot of um, interstitial fibrosis and, and breathing issues from that? So when we talk about treatment of gross metastatic disease, obviously 
I like Palladia, um, metronomic therapy. I usually use that as just an, ad, uh, an adjunct after they go through their typical cytotoxic chemo. Um, conventional cytotoxic, the story about, I told you about Reno, there is definitely some opportunity there. And then aerosolized drug delivery may be a little bit new and, and what's on the horizon for us. So I get this question sometimes, can't you just cut them out? So is surgery an option for metastatic disease? Can you do a metastectomy? Well, yeah, you can, and actually you can have some really great results from it. You just have to know when to do it. So a study was done. Again, that seems kind of the theme tonight. A study was done, a clinical trial was done to look at 36 dogs with pulmonary metastasis. All of these guys underwent surgery to have their, their, their metastatic disease, their metastatic nodules removed. No chemotherapy was given afterwards, and that was really smart of these investigators because so they made sure that any improvement, any overall survival time was due to surgery alone and not due to any adjunctive chemo. Well, the median survival time was 176 days in these dogs that had the metastatic nodules. But as you can see here, there was this huge variation in how they did. 20 days all the way up to 1,495 days. So the question was, is okay, obviously there are some dogs that do real well with it, and there are some dogs that don't do real well with this procedure. So who do you do it in? And so there are some very, very concrete rules that you need to know if you're ever considered doing a metastatomy. Because again, you can definitely have some really good results with it. You just have to know when to use it. So. Four big things that I always tell owners and four big things that I always keep in the back of my mind when I'm going to, do a meta, or when I'm going to talk to an owner about a metastectomy. Uh, primary tumor removed or in remission for greater than 300 days. That means that these guys either have to have had a limb spare or an amputation or you are controlling the disease at that primary site and it's not causing them any kind of clinical issues or problems. You cannot do that because they're going to, then you're going to go through this procedure and they're still going to pass away of that local disease. Honestly, you really don't want to have more than uh, three nodules. So usually less than three nodules is what we like to have on thoracic radiographs. If you have multiple nodules and multiple lung lobes, the feasibility and the, and the overall quality afterwards is not as good as we want it to be. Dogs that had less than three nodules did really, really well. And they need to have a long doubling time. So what that means is you need to go about a month from when you're considering a metastectomy and not see any new lesions, any new visible lesions coming up, and not seeing doubling of that tumor where it's two or three times bigger in 30 days than where it was. And then honestly, you just need to have the disease in the lungs. Again, the primary tumor in check and no bone, uh, bone lesions, skeletal lesions, skin lesions, muscle lesions, localized. You just got two pesky nodules sitting in the lungs and you want to take them out. So as you can imagine, that narrowed the window quite a bit on the patients we do this in. But if you fit in that category, going to surgery may be extremely beneficial and it may remove those metastatic nodules and those dogs go on and live for a very, very long time. To know that they fit in that category, considering things like a CT scan or in humans a PET CT can be real beneficial to pick up any early metastatic nodules. Again, you want to make sure you've, you're, you're limited to how many nodules are in those long lobes. Um, and considering the bone scan or scintigraphy again can be a really good thing to make sure that the skeleton is not involved in any areas. The last thing that I'm going to have, and, and we're going to finish up with this, is just what if all the things we talked about tonight, like limb spare and, and amputation, are not feasible? Does that mean we're done with these guys? Because honestly, I told you all the stuff that I'm doing is really trying to give quantity, and what Dr. Calfee's doing is trying to give quality. So can we improve the quality of life without going to surgery? Well, two things we need to talk about. The first one is palliative radiation, and the second one is samarium. So palliative radiation therapy is your traditional linear accelerator, external beam radiation, teletherapy, can be used for primary or secondary bone lesions. It delivers ionized radiation. The way it provides analgesic effects is it's inducing apoptosis of the neoplastic cells, basically just reducing the burden of the cells that are there, reducing that tumor down a little bit in size. Um, it's also going to pull some significant inflammation out of that tumor, and it's just going to make the patient more comfortable. The nice thing about doing palliative radiation versus what you may be familiar with with definitive radiation is this is a pretty easy treatment protocol. These guys aren't going to, to Knoxville or Atlanta or Auburn for a month. They're going to go over there and they're going to get anywhere from one to two, up to four treatments of radiation to the bone and come home. The idea is we're getting enough radiation in there to make a significant difference in inflammation and, and, and cause a little apoptosis or reduction of the tumor and make that guy more comfortable. So if we do this, we get actually a really good response. 74 to 93 percent of patients who undergo palliative radiation, and this is actually a real consistent number that we see, um, have some response and some palliation of their pain and feel a lot better after radiation. It's not too terribly expensive, it's pretty easy for them to do, and it's a pretty short treatment protocol. 
The biggest downside to it is this right here, the duration of the response. So the duration of response is going to be anywhere from two to four months. I mean, that's, that's kind of what I see. Um, it can be repeated. So if you have a patient that goes four months and he got two or three doses of radiation and you say, well, he's painful again, it's been four months, he can go back to Knoxville and get a couple more doses and come back, and oftentimes he will again be more comfortable. Usually we don't repeat it after that. Um, we're putting somewhere in these guys, as you can imagine, we're putting somewhere in these guys up to about 30 gray, uh, and gray is what we're measuring radiation in. Once you get over 60 gray, you're starting to cause some, some significant effects uh, or potentially can cause some significant effects to some of the normal cells in that area, causing increasing your chance of fracture in the bone, increasing your chance of skin side effects and muscle side effects in that area. If we had a patient who did not have an amputation, who did not have... Um, a uh, limb spare procedure, and we said, you know, what can we do? Well, we can do palliative radiation and do chemotherapy of what I talked about with carboplatin and expect somewhere around this number. That's kind of a ballpark of what I see. Ultimately, to tell you the truth, this number comes from the quality of life issue. I'm going to control the metastasis pretty consistently with chemotherapy. Um, I, I have pretty, pretty good confidence that the chemotherapy will prevent any metastatic nodules from becoming too big of an issue. But with palliative RT in about eight months, we're probably going to run out of pain control there. They're going to be on tramadol. They're going to be on an inset. They're going to be on gabapentin. Um, and, and at that point, they may start to be more uncomfortable. In eight months, we're usually making a decision. But that's kind of what I would tell an owner if we weren't going to do surgical therapy and we were going to use something like palliative radiation. So Samarium, you may or may not be familiar with Samarium. Samarium 153 EDTMP is a radioisotope. Think about Samarium like iodine 131. Iodine 131 is going to be used to target thyroid. Samarium is going to be used to target patients with bony neoplasms. Used in humans first and then into veterinary patients. And it has shown efficacy in palliating pain as well as some anti-tumor properties. The way samarium works is it's actually conjugated to a bisphosphonate, EDTMP, and it will that EDTMP, that bisphosphonate, actually binds to areas of osteoblastic turnover or, uh, or activity. You can do the bone scan again, uh, nuclear scintigraphy, as an accurate predictor of where your samarium is going to be taken up. So if you have a real lytic lesion, and it may not take up samarium because it needs that, that osteoblastic activity for the, the bisphosphonate to bind to. But you can do a bone scan. If you have uptake in an area with the bone scan, then you're most likely going to have uptake with the samarium. And I'll show you an image of the two here in just a second. The way it works is once the samarium becomes localized, it's going to decay over time. Basically, it's radioactive. And as it decays, it emits radiation in about two to three millimeters diameter around it, and that radiation is targeting all of these different lesions, just as the ionizing radiation would do if we were delivering it from an external beam source. So it's nice because it can target the primary tumor as well as any secondary lesions that you may have. So here's an actual image of a human with metastatic osteosarcoma everywhere. You don't want to be this guy. So this is metastatic through multiple areas, and this is actually on the bone scan with Tech 99. Um, you can see the bladders highlighted because it goes through you so fast with Tech 99. It actually will in, it will sh highlight your bladder because it's already entering your bladder as you're given as you're being given the drug. But in this scan, you can see the multiple areas that are being highlighted. This is after samarium. You can image samarium as well, and so you can see most of the areas that were highlighted with the technesium scan were actually highlighted with samarium once they were given it. So this guy is going to get this drug, hopefully get a radiation emitted, and feel a lot better and have a lot of palliation of his disease. Various clinical trials have been done um, with samarium in dogs. And overall, we do see a pretty good response rate again. 63 to 83% of dogs that have samarium show some stable to improve response and improve disease uh, in terms of just feeling better. That's really based on lameness scores. There's a lot of different ways to, uh, to evaluate dogs for lameness, um, and it is a subjective, uh, subjective measure. Obviously, in humans, you can just ask them. In dogs, we have to do some things, but most of them just show some improvement. Uh, Approximately 5%, actually, interesting enough, in some of these studies will show some complete resolution of skeletal uh, metastasis. That is best case scenario, but obviously it's very low. It's a low number of patients that do. Again, the duration on samarium, in my experience, is about two to four months. Um, so that's where you're going to run into the issues with. 
Samarium, when do you use it? So it's an uh, improved response seen, obviously, with heavily calcified tumors because it has to be the osteoblastic. So you don't want to use it in one that's, that's real lytic. And it works really nice for the two centimeter diameter tumors. So sometimes you can't get the samarium to the center of the big tumors or into the big tumors. Um, so the little metastatic nodules in the ribs or, or in certain areas, those are the ones that seem to have a really, really good response. Multifocal disease, that's when you use it, to be honest with you, in the, in the simplest sense. If you have a solitary lesion and you're going to just palliate it, use external beam radiation. It's easier. Uh, it's easier to deliver, um, and uh, it has a little bit higher response rate. If you have multiple nodules all throughout the skeleton, you're not going to be able to radiate that entire patient. Samarium is an option that you can do. I actually did a clinical trial or a clinical study um, and wrote a paper on samarium when I was doing my residency. We looked at 20 dogs that actually had skull tumors. This is an option for skull tumors because they're sometimes they're very, very challenging to treat. These patients were a hodgepodge of all kinds of stuff. They'd been cut on two or three times in some cases or never cut on in some cases. They'd got chemo in some cases. In some cases, they didn't. The whole idea was you've got these guys, you're at the end of your row. Can you give them something and just see if you can get them some more time and make them more comfortable? In that one, we had a really, really, really good response in terms of pain palliation with four dogs, and then there were some others that were kind of so-so. But we reported basically a four, um, a four out of 20 that had a really good subjective improvement. Again, not great numbers. A couple of those dogs did all, went a long time, though. Uh, the median after we gave it was 144 days. One notable thing that we saw was a really low metastatic rate. Now, osteosarcoma in the uh, axillary skeleton um, in the skull is going to have a lower metastatic rate. I will tell you that compared to uh, appendicular tumors. But this was uncharacteristically low. Only one dog out of 20 actually had any metastatic disease during the whole study. So option for skull tumors and then multifocal disease. So just last slide uh, as a summary. Locally invasive, highly metastatic disease, osteosarcoma, high metastatic rate up to 90% with surgery or no treatment. Osteosarcoma, always a two-fold treatment plan. That's why we did this together tonight. It's just because to drive home the point that we want to work on these as a team. We want to do the local therapy, and then we want to move into the, the systemic therapy. Where's the future? Well, right now we're doing pretty good with our conventional therapy, getting a quarter of these dogs out to two years. But where we're going with it is combining cytotoxic, metronomic, immunotherapies, molecular targeted. Um, and then this is probably the big one I want you to remember is metastasis can be treated. Some of these guys can do very well. And then even metastectomy, if we have the right candidate, can be done here. Uh, and then certainly don't ever hesitate to call me. I mean, if you guys have any questions, I'm always here. I'm always happy to chat with you about what you got going on, give you some ideas of what's out there and what's new. Uh, and so give us a call anytime. And thank you very much.